Hi, my name's John Goldingay. Uh, I used to be the principal of St John's College, Nottingham, but now I am an Old Testament professor at Fuller Theological Seminary uh, in Pasadena in California. Uh, but I've been excited to be back at St John's once or twice uh, during the summer. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something that I've been thinking about recently. People often ask me uh, why I'm so excited about the Old Testament. And the background to that question is, of course, the neglect of the Old Testament in the church and the assumption that really it's been superseded by the New Testament. Uh, it's uh, exciting in a way for me to realize that things aren't as bad in that respect in England as they are in the United States. So there. Um, and that's partly because, or it's true at least insofar as in the Church of England, in the Anglican Church in England, as in the Episcopal Church in the United States, uh, there's much more reading of the Old Testament in church than there is in other sorts of churches. So the, the, there's a bit more acquaintance with the Old Testament uh, in England uh, than there is in the United States. And yet nevertheless there's still a sense of not being quite sure what to do with it and a suspicion that it's been outdated by Jesus. And so I want to turn that kind of um, assumption, that kind of questioning, on its head really and ask, do we really need the New Testament? Because my conviction is that there is so much more in the Old Testament that people haven't realised is really significant for us. Uh, and that of course we do need the New Testament, but that we need to uh, articulate a bit more clearly why it is we need the New Testament and what it's for really. People often think that Jesus himself went beyond the Old Testament in his, in his teaching about ethics, uh, about how we ought to live. So that's where I'll start. Jesus do himself doesn't really talk in those terms. Uh, in the New Testament itself, uh, he, he starts off by talking about coming in order to fulfill the law and the prophets, not to abolish them. And what he, makes, what he means by fulfilling them, I think he illustrates quite neatly, not surprisingly, uh, in the chapters that follow in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says things about uh, attitudes in life that people need to have, and talks about things that people have heard said, and things that he says. And often modern readers think he is making a contrast with the Old Testament, but he isn't. And not least is that the case when he says that they have heard uh, that they should love their enemy and hate, that, that they should love their neighbour and hate their enemy. Well, it doesn't say that in the Old Testament. Indeed, when uh, the Old Testament talks about loving your neighbour, in effect, it's talking about loving your enemy. I mean, nobody really needs to be told to love their neighbour when they're getting on okay with their neighbour. The, the context of that exhortation in Leviticus uh, is one that makes clear that Leviticus is talking about when, when you're in difficulties with your neighbour, when you're tempted to be hostile towards your neighbour. Uh, that's the context in which you need to be prepared to love your neighbour. So loving your neighbour in the Old Testament itself implies loving your enemy. And although there are of course uh, lots of examples of wars and so on in the Old Testament, there are also lots of passages that make clear that people assume to the, that uh, one ought to love one's neighbour, uh, even the one who is one's enemy, uh, in everyday life, as the story of Joseph and his brothers particularly clearly shows. So Jesus is fulfilling the law by bringing out the implications of the law, by making explicit things that are implicit there. And no Jew in Jesus' day would have found the kind of thing that Jesus uh, is saying there uh, extraordinary or objectionable. He gives a couple more clues uh, with regard to his own attitude to the Old Testament law. One of them is when he was asked to summarise the law, or asked, to what, asked what were the most important commandments of the law. And he picks out two of the Old Testament commands. Uh, one is that command to love your neighbour, but before that is the one to love God. And then says, all the commandments in the law and the prophets hang on, depend on, are the outworking of those commandments to love God and love your neighbour. And therefore, whenever you're reading the Old Testament, reading the Law or the Prophets, um, it's worth asking the question, if there's an imperative, a command, an exhortation here, uh, 
Jesus implies, ask the question, how is this an expression of love for God and how is this an expression of love for one's neighbour? He doesn't imply that these commands may be the expression of something else. The other clue that he gives about ethics uh, is when he's again asked by somebody a, a question and it's a question about whether divorce is okay. Uh, and Jesus says, well, divorce isn't really a great idea, as you can see from reading the creation story. So why uh, did Moses allow for divorce, he's asked. Well, uh, Moses was making an allowance for your hardness of hearts. He's making an allowance for human sinfulness. And that willingness on God's part to make allowance for human sinfulness uh, is one of the expressions of God's love to the world, actually. In a paradoxical sense, what we might think of as the lower standard of uh, much of the Old Testament law uh, is, is an expression of God's love because God is recognizing, for instance, that marriage is going to break down and women then are going to be in a vulnerable position. Nobody knows what their status, they can't establish what their status is. So Moses says, uh, let's uh, have an arrangement whereby they get a divorce certificate so it's clear what their status is. God is uh, expressing his love paradoxically by allowing for there to be a lower standard in Israel. And I'd say that the same thing is true about the New Testament. That is, it's not that the Old Testament is a low standard and the New Testament is a high standard, but when the New Testament takes for granted the existence of slavery, and in fact um, is less questioning about slavery than the Old Testament is, or when the, Old Testament, uh, when the New Testament talks about uh, wives submitting to their husbands, which isn't something that the Old Testament requires, uh, it's making allowance for fact, the facts about how things are uh, in life and starting where people are and God is not simply saying, well, if you ignore my ideal standards, you're on your own, uh, but is working with the realities of how human life works out. So when Jesus at least talks about the Old Testament with regard to ethical sorts of questions, he doesn't see it as being um, faulty he sees it as an expression uh, of God's love in giving people some teaching about what are the ideal standards that go back to creation and what are also the ways in which God is making allowance for human sinfulness. Jesus doesn't in that sense then go beyond the uh, deeper demands within the Old Testament about ethics. You can say something similar about spirituality. Again, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount starts with those beatitudes, those blessings that Jesus issues about people who are concerned for righteousness and so on. And nearly every line of those beatitudes is based on something out of the Old Testament, out of what would be for Jesus simply the scriptures, mostly out of Psalms and out of Isaiah. Now Jesus does something new with them. In a sense you could say he is again fulfilling them but the raw materials for the kind of teaching he gives about a life with God come out of the Old Testament and therefore uh, invite you to look back in there for insight on what it means to live with God. And a letter like Ephesians later on in the New Testament makes the same kind of assumption. What does worship involve? Well, Ephesians tells you worship, praise and so on involves worshiping God in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, I'm sure those spiritual songs aren't confined to the songs, the psalms within the Old Testament, but I'm also sure that they include them and that when Paul talks uh, about praise and about prayer and about thanksgiving, he's got in his mind, out of his own background, uh, the assumption that the kind of material about praise and prayer uh, and thanksgiving that you find in the psalms is the natural material for the Christian churches to be using in their own worship and for individuals to be using in their own life with God. So if you want to know how to praise God and how to pray and how to give thanks, then read the Psalms by implication, Ephesians is saying. And one of the things that strikes me again about